Welcome, everyone. I'm here with David Butler, also known as DJ Butler. Uh, and he's a science fiction, fantasy, and well, you don't really, I guess you do. You, I wonder if you write any horror, but we'll find that out. Uh, if you could give, uh, David, if, Dave, if you could, if you could give the, the audience kind of a background of where are you from? Uh, how did you get into writing, et cetera? Uh, great question. Uh, I'm basically from Utah. Um, here's a little fun trivia fact, Sean, that uh, I did not tell you while we were having our earlier conversation. So I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, uh, surely you've heard the, the name Stephen R. Covey and the Seven Habits of Highly Effective yes. People. Yeah. So here's the fun trivia fact. Useless, but 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 true. Uh, this house that Emily and I own is actually the original Stephen and Sandra Covey home that they built in 1958. Wow. And this room is actually Stephen's office and it's actually never been remodeled. So I'm sitting here. I'm actually in Provo, Utah right now. These uh, wooden paneled walls were put up in, in the popcorn style plaster ceiling. And best of all, the uh, green shag carpet uh, <laughs> are, uh, date to 1958. And this is the room where Stephen paced up and down, cracking his knuckles and saying, seven habits or six. I'm not sure about sharpening the saw. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so Utah uh, is where I'm from. Uh, I, um, that makes it sound like I've never lived anywhere else. That's not true. I, I lived in London five years. I went to law school in New York, was up in Idaho for about eight. Um, so, uh, and, uh, and let's see what else you said and, and what I write. So when I was a kid, um, my, uh, my dad was an economics professor and he came back from a conference one day when I was in the second grade and he had this, uh, this, this box set paperback silver Jubilee edition of the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit with the Daryl K. Sweet covers. And, uh, and he gave it to me and I basically didn't get out of bed for a week. I just lay in bed and read, <laughs> read the book, almost burned the house down because I fell asleep and my headlamp crumpled forward under my pillow. And I woke up and it burned a hole, the circumference of the lamp uh, shade into the pillow. So, or into the pillowcase. So, um, so I was convinced I was going to be a writer from the, you know, the age of eight. Uh, and moreover, specifically that I was going to be J.R.R. Tolkien. And, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, I did the, the kinds of things that you would do. I read a lot. I look, I, I, I look for other Tolkien like books. I took uh, creative writing classes in, in junior high and in high school and, uh, and, and uh, got all the way to, through college um, and then I uh, met a woman that I wanted to marry, and it didn't seem fair to make her be poor. So instead of going and trying to make a living writing fantasy novels, I went to law school. So uh, I went to law school at uh, NYU, New York University, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, then worked full time as a corporate lawyer for about 11 years, uh, London five years uh six what, years what, and what law firm did you work for i mean if you graduated from new york and worked for a new york law firm in like corporate law that's it, it, it was actually a london-based firm so the huh. the biggest london law firms are called the magic circle and i worked for a magic circle firm called clifford chance and at okay. the time we said uh we were the world's biggest law firm uh, Baker McKenzie said, no, we're bigger. We said, no, you have a franchise model that doesn't count. But anyway, we were one of the world's biggest law firms. Okay. So you worked with like uh, corporations, investment bankers when they're doing transactions, like extremely high stress. Yeah. Big uh, multi hundred million dollar deals, uh, raising capital, uh, equity or debt issues. A lot of high yield bond work was kind of the market that was hot when I was over there. A little bit of mergers and acquisitions. Which means you uh, probably yeah. worked in like 2005, 2006, 2007, when there was lots of high yield bonds. Uh, like yes. So actually, uh, yeah, actually uh, from 99 to 2005 was when I was at the firm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, when, I was, when I was in law school, I thought, this is sort of bringing back around to current events. When I went out as a summer associate, Russia was hot. 
And so I was like, okay, I can see myself doing Russian deals. And we had guys overworking in Russia all the time, these Russian bonds. And so I, my senior year of law school, I'm kind of a language guy. I was, I was fiddling around teaching myself Russian. And then, and it totally collapsed. By the time I got, uh, you know, back to the firm, that market was entirely gone. So I was working with I mean, whatever, Polish uh, cell phone issuer, uh, cell phone companies, uh, phone book, UK phone book publishers, Spanish cable companies, you know, raising money. And what, um, like, what, what law did you have? Like, is that uh, U.S. corporate law or like? Yeah, that's an interesting question. This kind of this kind of connects back um some of the things Sorry, you I don't mean to take like this this path, but it's no, no, no. This is, this is I, I go where the questions lead, right? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, why on earth would they need a New York qualified lawyer? Well, yeah. so the answer is because there was a lot of money in the U.S., and the answer is also because U.S. law. This is true of the SEC, and it's also true of like the IRS. A lot of countries basically say, "Well, look." Our law doesn't really extend beyond our borders. So things that happen outside beyond our borders, we're not going to tax you on income out there. We're not going to come after you for transactions out there. The U.S. says, well, screw that. We are king and we will come after you. Right. So um, so uh, people who want to raise money where they have any kind of connection to the U.S. Right. basically has to involve some kind of U.S. legal advice. OK. Um, and. Uh, and, and that's what it was. We, you know, if you companies that issue these, these big bond issuances or sell uh, like ADRs or whatever, so, mm -hmm. so sell their shares in the U.S. Um, and you'd have to have U.S. lawyers doing the deals. So, which was a great education because basically what I was, was a due diligence professional for six mm -hmm. years, right? I, go, I mean, some negotiations, uh, some drafting, but fundamentally, let me go figure out how this business works, interviews, read documents, iterative drafts of writing, you know, a prospectus, a novel describing. Yeah, you're company. the guy who wrote the risk factors, right? That, that's right. The parade of horribles, but also the MDNA and the description of business and stuff. Although the MDNA usually you go, you know, uh, in 2012, revenue rose by 7%. This was principally due to blob. And then you email the CFO and say, please fill in all of the blobs. <laughs> no, I wrote, I wrote uh, a few, like the, the company strategy sections of the perspectives oh, yeah. and things like that when I was in kind of on the banking side. So, yeah, I remember, I remember that. And you needed for the risk factors, you needed... Uh, uh, or the legal would come in and have you, you have to back oh, everything yeah. up, right? Oh, Which is yeah, a good yeah. thing to do. But, you know, if you don't do that, you'll get some of these crazy founders who are just like, you know, our market is bigger than the entire market on the planet if you actually do your due diligence and back into the numbers yeah. I'm throwing out at you. So, yeah. right. anyway, sorry, keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so I did that for 11 years, and, and then at the end of 11 years, had some luck, which resulted in me having some cash and the opportunity to take a 90-degree turn in my career uh, of, of my choice. And so what I did is start writing. Um, and in fact, uh, after I, well, the first thing I wrote was crap. But the second thing I wrote got an agent. And then my wife concluded, well, I, if Dave can do that, obviously I can do that. So then she went out and got an agent, and this turned into kind of our household business um so uh so yeah i still actually do a little bit of law uh i do a lot of corporate training uh and some consulting i'm actually i've got my uh series 79 uh so i'm actually uh i don't have a broker dealer right now but you know i've done a little bit of investment banking kind of work yeah i think so, i need to get like a series seven a series 63 and like two or three other ones but go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, depending on when you took it, maybe the SIE, the Securities Industry Essentials. Um, mm -mm. That's a more recent one. Maybe maybe yeah, you took it recent. before that was around. Yeah, I think they carved that out of the old Series 7 or something. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's kind of my, that's me, not as a, not as me as a, as a non-writing professional. Um, I, I still do that stuff uh still married to emily we have we have three kids and a dog uh, our oldest is uh what eight, 18 turns nine so they're 19 17 and 14 now okay um 
Now, uh, am I, have I become J.R.R. Tolkien? Well, I don't know. I'm, uh, so I write a lot of stuff. I have written horror short stories. Um, actually, uh, I'll, I'll, um, so Sean, I'm actually uncomfortable with the word fan. The word fan sort of, uh, it, I implies, be weird it, implies, about. it implies like a, a one, like a unidirectional relationship. Whereas it does. And, and also literally, yeah. And also literally where it comes is the word fanatic, which literally comes from the Latin word fanum, which is a temple. And I feel like I don't, that's not what I want. <laughs> Right. I want readers and I want friends. Uh, right. So a longtime friend and, and reader read my short story collection recently. And he said, he emailed me and said, man, the one that really was impactful was this one, which A, was a horror story and B, is like the first short story I ever published. So I was like, man, I have not improved in 10 years. But um, I do write horror. Uh, I've got uh, a steampunk series out for kids. So it's a, an action steampunk retelling of Pinocchio. Uh, what's the, what's the got, name of it so that people can find it so the first book is called the kidnap plot and it okay. is about uh charlie charlie is a reader uh but what he wants to be is an adventurer but he lives in london which is dirty and dangerous so his dad won't let him leave home uh but one day trolls kidnap charlie's father charlie to rescue his dad has to become the adventurer of his dreams so um so yeah, so that's a that's a trilogy from Random House. Uh, I've got uh, I've got a got a realistic thriller called The Wilding Probate. Um, mm -hmm. I've got an epic fantasy series. This is my bid to be Tolkien, to be the American Tolkien. People say I've heard reviewers say, "Oh, George Martin or Robert Jordan or the American Tolkien." I don't think those are correct comparisons. We could talk at length about why. But uh, well, well, my kind of the, the, what's the short version? What's the short version? Why the short version is that neither of them has the substance that Tolkien has. Tolkien is writing about real things, meaningful things. Martin is a nihilist. Uh, Robert Jordan, I have not read. I have to say the TV show does not suggest he's he's got any any substance, but it's probably not a fair representation of him. No, it's not. It's not. Um, yeah. He, it's, he, it, he, he, he's, he's, he's some Vietnam veteran. I think he is like the, uh, across. Okay. The so that's interesting. Like yeah. But I, I mean, don't, that is, yeah, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to character. It depends on what things you're comparing him to, to Tolkien. Like he's certainly not, he certainly didn't create like multiple yeah. languages. He's not, you know, not a genius linguist. He's also yeah. not like uh, you went to Oxford or Cambridge. I, I forget. Uh, Tolkien was an Oxford Don. Uh, he taught at Oxford, uh, wrote some stuff that is still read today. Uh, there's an essay called Beowulf, the Monster and the Critics uh, mm -hmm. that is like still, you know, still still read as literary criticism. So they certainly weren't, you know, they're certainly not academics and neither of them fought in the song. So, yeah. 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 And, and by the way, I think that fighting thing matters and I am not a soldier, but I mean, that when, when you talk about the comparison with George R. R. Martin, you know, uh, George R. R. Martin had a career in Hollywood and uh, he avoided the draft. And then he writes about how humans are all bad and venal. Uh, J.R.R. R. Tolkien went with his friends. Well, he did, well Dave, Dave, he did work in Hollywood. Yeah. He did work at, well, that is my point, right? So J.R.R. Tolkien and his friends went to the Somme where the majority of them died uh, and then writes uh, about the importance of nobility and the importance of the West standing against mechanized, industrialized evil. And so I sort of want to vomit. People tell me how great George Martin is and how he's better than Tolkien. He's the American Tolkien. Like it's, that's a, that's a, terrible comparison now but here here's the other thing tolkien was writing a very specifically english fantasy he was writing a kind of a of a uh, uh a mythology a catholic mythology there's a great letter to a jesuit friend of his where he says no one's going to like this book it's way too catholic so for england so uh why, why did he I, say, like why, why would he consider it too in his argument right what was his argument for why it's too catholic so he doesn't say, but uh, that's a, that's a whole interesting conversation. We could we can go down that way a bit. Well, let's go so down. Let's go, 
there, there's just, some just, really interesting just stuff. just for just just to protect you <laughs> like yeah. i'm catholic so you're you're oh you're cool I'm, fa I'm fascinated with this not so really uh, i'm i was raised catholic. yeah and, and so we're gonna get maybe uh beyond my depth because i'm not catholic and there's a lot i don't know but let me let me point out you know kind of a couple i'll, I'll help out with that i'll help out with that <laughs> okay good yeah so calendrically the journey is a half year journey that starts at the fall uh, equinox and they depart Rivendell uh, Christmas and it ends at Easter. Okay. Uh, but, but also uh, there's this great moment in uh, the houses of the healing. Oh, fantastic. You got a visitor. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's okay. I'll, I'll allow it. I'll allow it for this. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Uh, so I, if my kids were at that age, they'd be all over me. Uh, so um, instead, they just want to have my car and my money and go drive away. So uh, yeah, so so uh, Frodo wakes up right in the houses of the healing when it's all over, and he's talking to Gandalf, and Gandalf says, uh, "Forever after will the men of Gondor remember March twenty fifth, because March twenty fifth is the day that Sauron fell." Which um, wait, so March twenty fifth is what? is the day that Sauron fell, okay? okay. So in, in Tolkien's calendar, right, the day when, uh, when Gollum takes the ring and falls into Mount Doom is March 25th. Whenever Tolkien's a medievalist, right? And he's a Catholic and he's like a, he's like a go so to is, mass is this, on a day. Is this like the Cat. Lent calendar or associated with Lent? So, so in the medieval uh english calendar the catholic calendar right because prior to 1533 or whatever right everybody's catholic so uh the march 25th is uh is under it's believed to be the day of the crucifixion so now what does that mean well it means that for tolkien the day when uh uh when Gollum takes the ring and goes in the, the lava dies is the same as the day when Christ bears the sins of the world. Right. Which is to say it, it, people talk about the Christian imagery in the, in the Lord of the Rings and there's a lot. Okay. But I think for Tolkien, the great Christ image is Gollum. He is the man of sorrows acquainted with grief in whom there is no beauty that we should desire him like the servant songs of Isaiah say, right? He's despised of the world, but he is the one who bears who the, the sin. Sin, great sin of the world to yeah. his own destruction to save the world, right? Now, uh, people never talk about Tolkien like that, but, but, I, but I, think, I think that's what the kind of thing he was thinking. So, um, so I don't know if Robert Jordan does that. Uh, where was I going yeah. with that? to say hey what do i write uh i've got an epic fantasy series that is my bid to be the myth the fantasy mythology of my america okay uh and uh it's four books out now i'm working on book five uh book six will be the end of it uh well, and it's called the witchy war the, okay yeah i was about to ask you tell everybody what, it, what it's called okay the witch what's the first very book good that they should check out book one is called witchy eye uh, this series has won uh, the Dragon Award. Book three, Witchy Kingdom, won the Dragon Award for alternate history. And it is about, um, it's the story of Sarah Calhoun, who is, uh, who is a hexer. She's, uh, the story opens in the year 1815. Uh, she is a, she's a talented witch. She is very smart. Uh, she is, uh, she's curious. She's fiercely loyal. She is also paranoid, xenophobic, and kind of mean. Uh, and she's taking the, the family young'uns, her cousins, down to sell the family tobacco crop at the fair in Nashville. And Imperial Army officers try to kidnap her. And it turns out she is the secret daughter of the dead empress and her uncle the living emperor has discovered her existence and wants her killed so it's this epic fantasy story with a with a lot of um very uh standard trophy or common yeah i mean it's a it's a quest to recover your throne it's a quest to recover your lost property to find the family you never knew you had but it is in an epic fantasy america which includes 
mound builders and red haired giants and uh, and uh, megatheria and all kinds of uh, sort of folk and mythological American elements and also is woven into biblical biblical story because uh, just to interrupt why red haired giants is that like a pulp like, oh man there's a lot of stories from like the 18th and 19th century about people finding the bodies of red haired giants so if you look up for example i think if you look up the wikipedia article ctk uh, uh let me let me confirm this here right now while i'm talking um there's a, there are caves in nevada they're called salt the salt caves maybe uh and uh yeah here we go uh and they found these really tall red-haired mummies inside and then the Paiutes sued and said hey these are our ancestors as confirmed by our i'm going to drop a link into the chat here uh as confirmed by our mythology um and and basically i think closed the caves but but there are there are hundreds of stories in newspapers about people finding now what's a what is a giant well six and a half feet tall some say some say eight feet tall okay have you Blonde heard of the uh, red hair. have you ever heard of the the giant of kandahar uh no I, look i i don't think it's real i want to be very clear but it's one of those okay. one of those interesting uh stories so i'll tell it real quick but again okay. I, I want to be very clear i don't believe this because i've i've reached Understood. out to some people who were there during the period and they're like what are you talking okay. about so okay. apparently there was this distress call by an american unit in you know outside of kandahar in a remote you know part of the mountains and a special forces unit was called in i don't know if it was delta i don't know if it was just regular army special this forces. is like post 2001 some point here this is when like american forces in there yeah i think it, i, I want to say it's like 2002 Okay, yeah. but it's it's between 2001 2002 is when it, this apocryphal okay. story like happened. Okay, yeah. So they get to the this mountain and they find like all the American equipment just strewn across the mountainside, and they find some bones. And they're like, "What? What the heck is this?" So they go go up the mountain, and there's a cave entrance, and they just see like this kind of like two eyes in the kind of in the distance. And then one of this one of the guys gets hit with like a javelin or something. Not like the javelin anti-tank stuff, but like, right, right. like a, spear, a spear. Right. And then this 12 foot tall redheaded giant emerges who has a very specific, who has like double rows of teeth, six uh -huh. fingers, six toes. Okay. Now it they, you know, the special forces team just unloaded on him and it took about a minute to kill him yeah but they got the body they 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 called in an air they, they, they called it in they shrouded it and then they took it away somewhere and there's some like air force guy who claims to have seen it and they made them sign non-disclosure agreements and yep. it just it just went away okay it's a yep. great story it's a great story right. but anyway that's what that's what triggered it so uh yeah it, yeah 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 you're 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 in a very this is the same space fundamentally so there's all these stories newspaper stories six to six and a half to eight foot tall red-haired people very consistent stories about you know they're buried sitting up their implements were all made of copper right and then you go well okay well where's the evidence like like uh, is is this just some sort of craze right some of these people some of these were allegedly debunked people you know they produce a body and someone would say that's not real that's made of gelatin or whatever well, but, when, but when, when historically did were these sightings were these people have been around uh like, would, it, would, it been, would it would it would have been the the time that you know they're there i think it's been historical evidence that the vikings were actually here much earlier oh yeah sure been. And they're tall, yeah, like, they're, you know, redhead, redhead. Junior. Yeah, but I think, I, so I think, well, so I don't think there are any, any of these sites have been excavated professionally. I think these are, you know, people, farmers dug up things in their backyards or people found things in the woods, right? So, so I don't know that we have a, we have a dating, but, but stories about these guys and theories still persist in like, you know, ancient America sort of fringe archaeology stuff. There are people who claim that 
the reason uh to go back to your kind of hush up non-disclosure agreement air force kind of thing uh who claimed that the smithsonian institute systematically deliberately went out and collected these bodies and destroyed them to hide this information for whatever reason right so here's the thing i don't need it to be true or false it doesn't matter yeah. to me whether this is true or false it's part right. of the mythology of america right you can't go to any part like the CTK and right it, that's nevada but you got these stories that you know they're all over the place back east and in the midwest so so the these red-haired giants are you know uh, a part of the uh, a part of the story um yeah, back and to the, back to the yeah, back to back to yeah, the, yeah. the mythology. Back to Sorry, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to take you on that diversion, but it was just fascinating. No, it's well, I love it. Uh, and um, so, and also like the biblical uh, narrative—that is to say, the not every European who came, but many of the Europeans who came, especially in the early centuries, saw themselves as still participating in the events of the biblical epic. Right, that they saw themselves as being prophesied by Jesus or by Joseph in Egypt or whoever, right? So like that is all uh, in there. Um, it's an impossibly big task. You know, you think about how relatively small England is and, and, it, and yet Tolkien was able to kind of extrapolate from that all of the epic he did. America is just much, much bigger. It's much, much bigger. So um so, but I love that series. Uh, four books out, uh, Dragon Award winning. Book five and six are the basically the next thing I'm going to write to bring you got, it to you got a Skinwalkers in it. Um, I uh, I don't, but I do have Skinwalkers in, in another series. Uh, so, um, and the reason reason I ask is you're in Utah, and there's the I am in Utah. The, yeah, yeah, the yeah. over there, Skinwalker Ranch. So I figured yeah. I'd throw that out there. Uh. So that's interesting. So I have two books co-written with Aaron Michael Ritchie. The first one is called The Cunning Man, and the second one is called The Jupiter Knife. Uh, and and I will tell you, isn't the Jupiter Knife coming? Some version of it's coming out next or this month? Or March, uh, right? Yes, that's right. The paperback, the mass market paperback, came yeah. out like uh, either in February or in March. Either it's imminent or it just happened. I think it's imminent. That's yeah. right. Uh, so, uh, this, these books are in the 1930s, 1935. And the protagonist is a guy named Hiram Woolley. He is a farmer. He drives a model AA Ford pickup truck and he's got an adopted Navajo son, uh, named Michael, uh, who, uh, is hella smart and has a big chip on his shoulder. And in addition to being a farmer, Hiram also practices his grandma Hetty's traditional magical lore. Now, uh, one of the fun things about this series is all of the magic that Hiram does comes out of historical accounts. So one of the things we worried about is we thought we're going to turn this book in and Tony Weisskopf going to send it back and say, no, I want to see fireballs and flying. And that doesn't happen because that's not what wizards did in, in, you know, medieval, early modern, or if you go contact the wizards today, they do more subtle things. And so, you know, he works with a dousing rod and, you know, does divination with sieven shears and, and uh, his, you know, magic by stones. He carries a, um, a uh, bloodstone in his pocket to stanch the flow of blood uh, and uh, wears a Cairo medallion to protect him from harm from enemies, right? So uh, those books are set. The first two are both in kind of eastern Utah. And, and actually, fun fact, The Cunning Man is being taught at a, is a, a university mm -hmm. curriculum. So in April, uh, Aaron and I are going to go in to talk to the class that is, that is reading this book. But the guy who's teaching it, he called me uh, and, and he wanted to interview me. We had like a three hour interview about these books. And, and he said, apropos of skinwalkers, this is where I'm going. He said, now, look, you have this chapter in the Jupiter knife. He said, is that deliberately modeled on skinwalker narratives? Because it exactly fits the pattern, the classic pattern of skinwalker stories. And I said, well, 
hadn't thought about it that way, but yes, you know, I'm, I'm aware of the stories and it, it is that kind of thing. So, uh, so what, what's the so, classic yeah. pattern? What's the classic pattern? If you could sum up. Uh, it, well, he said, uh, you know, uh, see a mysterious figure. Uh, is it human? Nope. Appears to be an animal. And then closer and closer encounters as it tries to catch you or track you. Uh, and then you get away by the skin of your teeth. Uh, he said, that's, 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 that's what the skinwalker stories all tell. So, um, so uh, yeah, so uh, so that's a fun series. Um, uh, urban fantasy, historical, occult detective. I don't know quite what the genre is. Uh, some somewhere in there. Um, it's like it's almost I've like got, weird weird historical fiction. fiction. Yeah, it, it, that's right. I mean, it's kind of like there's um, the closest stuff to it is Manly Wade Wellman's Silver John the Balladeer, if you know that, which is set in the 50s. John is a Korean war vet who plays guitar and um, by virtue of the songs he knows and also sort of the judicious use of silver. His guitar has old timey style silver strings. Uh, and silver repels evil magic so he will he will sometimes by playing or by touching a silver dollar or something defend himself but he he travels around the uh, you know Appalachia fighting strange horrors and witches and stuff it's like that in the 30s um, and again you know the uh, it uses real world magic the first book one of the there's there's an there's an evil witch he's a, he's a man all right, uh, uh, which which is a term that refers to a person's malevolent will, not to their sex. So he's a he's a he's a shopkeeper, uh, and uh, and he's an he's an evil wizard. And one way to see the cunning man is that the whole book it is a book long wizard's duel between these two guys from like chapter two to the last chapter, where every single move comes out of an actual historical grimoire uh the the uh you know the satora repo charm and the you know the use of the the lord's prayer recited backwards and uh you know the use of fire as a counter charm and all of it comes out of and so it's it's not a wizard's duel like you're used to seeing with lightning bolts and magic missiles it's this sort of slow motion cat and mouse game um a lot of where fun. do you find that where, like where do you find that information these days is not hard. Uh, it's, uh, I, I mean, I think, you know, it used to be you had to go to weird little bookstores or, or write obscure publishers in rural Pennsylvania. Um, man, Amazon, you can get everything. Uh, so, yeah, all, all kinds of classic uh, grimoires are in print. And I have a surprisingly large collection of books of magic. <laughs> um so there's that. I've got a uh, I've got a, uh, a a book. One book. I'm writing this. I'm finishing the second book now. The, the sequel is called "In the Palace of Shadow and Joy," uh, and it is a um, it's sort of a buddy comedy, okay. Uh, but it's also it's also a noir story. It's about these two guys, and they're both smart, but they're down on their luck, and they're they're trying to live as heroes in this old decadent city uh, and not quite, uh, not quite making it. Uh, one is, one is the, um, the epic poet of his people. He's memorized their sort of equivalent of the Iliad. Uh, he can tell that story, including, you know, all the dramatic gestures and voices and stuff. Uh, and he needs to find a successor because his people are dying and no, no one, no, none of the young people want to take on this role. So he's come to this deck in an old city to do it. Uh, and then the other guy uh, was a was a monk at a at the uh, the ashrama of a god dedicated to pure knowledge who uh, left when he fell in love, uh, but, uh, but lost the woman and is still sort of trying to uh, prove to her that he can be a, you know, a, a, a worldly success. So it's about these two guys um, getting caught up as the patsies uh, in, a, in an insurance and murder plot. Um, 
So uh, mostly it's funny. It's hard to describe it in a way that describes the plot and also gets across the fact that it's basically a banter-driven novel about two guys in kilts with swords. Um, so there's that. And then I've got a science fiction novel uh, coming out uh, in May. So when this hits the wires, it'll be a month out or something like that, six weeks maybe. So uh, Abbott in Darkness is about an accountant and Sean, it has actual accounting uh, oh, wow. because he, yeah. Because well, yeah. cause Larry Korea has got, you know, Monster Hunter, it's, you know, an accountant gets attacked by a werewolf, right? His boss. Yeah, but it's, but it's really about yeah. guns, right? Right, uh, right, right? He's like doing accounting work in like the, in his carol and his boss is a werewolf. And so he kills his boss. Uh, and this is a, um, Really what it is, is kind of a science fiction um, exploration of the East India Company, right? So oh, the, yeah, the, yeah. the East India Company set itself joint, up. Joint, joint stock companies, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. the, the, there was a fundamental problem with the East India Company and, and also the Dutch East India and West India Companies, these first big global enterprises. And that was you, you basically... Uh, had the, the government at home giving the power of government to entities that only had a profit motive and there was no way they could be policed because they were operating six months away from home. Right? It's like Blackwater. It's like, it's like a precursor to Blackwater combined with a corporation. That's, that's right. I, 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 and, yeah. Except now we can at least, we could get out to Iraq quickly, you know, right? I mean, in, in you know, 1700, it, you got to send an inspector. He might not make it. <laughs> and if he does, he's going to be there in six months. Uh, and, uh, and so this, this is just, you're just asking for trouble. And, and of course, you know, all kinds of uh, abuse and, and corruption. And so this, the story is, you know, uh, uh, mankind have met a couple of aliens, uh, but also we've discovered a wormhole near Jupiter, which, which goes 40 light years away to a, a system with several planets, one of which is Earth-like, and there are lots of natural resources to exploit. And there's a, uh, there's a federally chartered, cor chartered corporation called the Sarovar Company, which basically has exclusive rights to operate that wormhole and functionally speaking owns that star system. And, uh, and it is a great career opportunity. So John Abbott has his accounting degree. He's young, he got married young. He has two young kids and his wife and they got a bunch of debt and they, they borrow more to go take this, you know, 40 light year wormhole jump out to the Sarovar system. And, and then he starts to discover that it's corrupt. And, uh, and his boss appears to be corrupt and, and basically sends him in uh, to audit, you know, suspected fraud, but it turns out there's gun running and people are trying to kill him. And he starts to wonder, did, did his boss expect him just to like, is like, is he, is he being sacrificed? Is he sent in expected to be killed? Um, and uh, all this kind of science fiction background. Uh, so uh, yeah, so so that uh, that comes out in May. Abbott in Darkness. What, what uh, I think, what I think is, without having read read the book, obviously, what I think is interesting about that is that that's also an idea I've had in the past in terms of like how would you fund like colonies in space and that that motif comes where that method comes back up it's like a mercantilistic right um construct right but that was kind of the only way you could fund these big expensive right. projects right like you right. if a company does it you get to keep the spoils to give you an incentive but it has a very high probability of failure so yeah you know that and unfortunately that might be what the what the model is when you have to kind of uh, do this. I think it's not system. crazy to think, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, some, some, there's got to be some kind of, uh, um, yeah. Uh, it, I mean, if you're not, if you're not being funded by taxation, you got to pay people to take the risk, right? You got to give them a, an upside. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, so yes, there's like discussions of revenue recognition and depreciation in there. And uh, yeah, he is an actual accountant. He does shoot things and gets shot at. 
uh, but he, he is an actual space accountant. Um, do, you, do you do anything again? I, I don't want to. I don't, I don't want to belabor it too long. But another interesting thing that happens with finance in in space, right? Is do you have any relativistic effects, right? Because you have the difference in time and. Oh, that's interesting. Know, so the well, so, way so, so I, I'm not a big fan of Paul Krugman, but like the 1970s, yeah. I think he wrote a paper on it. Like uh, how you would uh, yeah. handle finance and um, you know the relativistic effects of different uh, localities that you know one one more time is passing slower, right? If time's passing faster somewhere else, you want your money in that locality, right? That is actually very very interesting. I have not touched on that at all. So the way I've got it set up is uh, basically. Uh, and in a sense, this is, I think, to be more realistic, although when we're talking about traveling through wormholes, we're, we're really pretty far beyond, you know, realism we can touch right now. Right. But also to kind of model the situation of the, of the big early modern companies, uh, the, uh, the company basically runs its own bank. There's a depository and we, we print our own dollars for your convenience and we'll trade them one for one U.S. dollars. But you know, messages and transactions back and forth to Earth. It's like six months e- either way, right? So, um, so I haven't thought about about the relativistic effects. I'm gonna have to think about that now and and see if there's sorry, a place. Sorry, I didn't mean to. I didn't. The other the other thing you might want to think about is by that point, um, you might have quantum communications. But I think what you need to do is whatever one element from that, from like a radio, might have to travel all the way to. Like something that was quantumly coupled. But I don't yeah. know. I, yeah, I'm not a I'm not entangled a electrons or whatever. Yeah, yeah I don't want fact. that to happen though. I want the isolation. That's part of yeah, the story. That's fair. I that's hope fair. in real life when this happens that we have instantaneous communication. That for sure will make uh, uh, make a lot of things work better. Um, uh, do you do you game at all? We haven't talked about that. Uh, uh, so there's a classic science fiction role playing game called Traveler. Okay. Okay. I, and I one of the places. Of okay. I mean, date back dates back to the '70s. It's it's been around a long time. One of the places the Traveler setting always sort of falls down is when they get to things like the stock market and corporations, and it's because they sort of assume away their otherwise consistent position on uh, space travel, right? So like like information is supposed to only travel at the speed that people do which is faster than light but still relatively slow and in that situation you know like a stock market is really going to look different than a stock market does now where it takes seconds for data to get to from tokyo to new york right uh and they sort of just wave that away so um so yes i hope when we actually do it I hope very, very. I hope we can send data faster than people. Um, but in the story, no. In the story, it takes a long time. Well, it makes for a better story, which makes sense. It makes for, yes. Well, he has to. He's making a giant bet, right? He's, his his life, his family's lives, all their wealth is tied up and committed to. I'm going to go here, and what's the big advantage to me? Well, like the East India Company historically did, right? The East India Company didn't pay you that much, but they let you trade for your own account. So these guys would go out there and they'd be like a little clerk getting a little clerk stipend, but then they would buy cloth and ship it home or buy spices, right? And ship it home. And you could make even as a relatively, even if you were being honest and you weren't out there plundering uh, as some were, right? You could make a lot of money. And that's, that's the enticement for John. That's what he's, he's there to make his fortune and has to not become corrupt in the process that's the challenge all right let's uh i want to ask you a question about right now you're effectively making your living as as a writer for people who want to get there someday uh where they're not kind of doing the usual nine to five what advice would you give writers uh that is really interesting so um man there's there's a lot to say um let me, let me let me try to say several things. So first of all, it's likely that uh, if you become a full time writer at, at a at some part of that, and especially at the beginning, it's likely that you've got a partner who has sort of agreed that 
he or she is going to go out and do the nine to five, right? So I would say, man, it's really important to um, be careful and generous and explicit when you make those deals, right? Don't 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 try to make that person uh, carry the burden uh, without their consent, right? Like talk about it. What do you need in return? What makes this work for you? Um, I, I, so that's one thing. Uh, I think, I think another thing is, um, that, uh, I think it's very valuable not to be only a writer. I think, I think this is true of any profession. I think it's increasingly, um, you know, we don't really live in the in the in the age anymore where you went to work for a company at 18 and you retired at 68, right, from the same company. That just doesn't happen. And so I think it's very helpful to be nimble, to be a jack of all trades, to be a learner, right? Uh, and so I think if you can be a writer and there's something else that you can also do, or at least be able to do, right? And, and in the best of all worlds, be able to pick it up and just uh, like practicing law is not a great thing because you got to go out and find clients and that takes time, right? But if you had a skill where you could quickly kind of turn on a money tap, whatever that is, right? Um, I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that's really, uh, really worth doing. Um, I think uh, something else uh, and, and and I think actually this is sort of true. Um, if you if you never are a full time writer, I think this is still true. I think I think volume matters. I think you get people like James Joyce who write you know what is it two novels and a short story collection, and they get and they get known for that, right? Um, but I think uh, a much more likely bet on a meaningful and successful literary career is to write a lot of stuff. Uh, every book or play or poem or song or screenplay is another bet. It's another shot you've taken, right? And, and odds are, dear listener, you cannot name all of Shakespeare's plays, right? Odds are, off the top of your head, you might be able to think of four or five. Or if you're really into plays, maybe you can, and you're, oh, the historical ones, Kings of England, right? You probably, you know, you're going to fall down and not remember Titus Andronicus or Cymbeline or something, right? Or all of uh, Charles Dickens's novels. Um, and, and I think that's a um, more likely model of hitting success than writing the infinite jest and out, right? Um, so uh, well, it's like an investing. So, Diversification is your only, is the only free lunch in investing. I think, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, so and so that's right. That's right. So there's diversification. Have other skills, but also diversification. Have multiple books, right? Have 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 multiple multiple books. If all of that sounds like work then you are understanding me correctly <laughs> because I, I, I uh, fundamentally believe that the biggest possible success is going to be driven by luck, but you just cannot qualify um, unless you have books out there. Uh, and, uh, and so I think, I think, you know, uh, I think your opportunities are all going to come in the form of, of working hard. Any final advice for people who are watching this? Oh man, um, who are writers? Yeah, or primarily. Just final advice. Prim or, primarily or, or, writers. Well, actually, actually, the broader the audience, the better. But uh, yeah, I think that's <laughs> probably right. Isn't it? Yeah. Um, you know, I think uh, I'm going to say this, even if it maybe arguably cuts back against what I just said. A little bit um uh but especially if you're doing creative things okay um i i would urge you not to do them just for the money it's great to get money right it's great to get money but but i think often uh getting money means 
uh, or, or, or making the most money uh, comes from making the worst art. Uh, and, and I think, uh, look, you as an artist, um, also you as a human being, uh, you have things that are unique to you. Uh, and I would say, uh, don't be shy about them. Uh, don't hide them, put them in your art, uh, contribute them to the world. I think that our plastic uh, mass media homogenized national and international pop culture is anathema to the human spirit. Um, and, uh, and one, one, here's where I can harmonize what I'm saying. Hey, one beauty of, of, of producing, uh, lots of, uh, um, lots of works of art is, is you're, you're putting your voice out there. You're putting your insight, your unique contributions out in the culture and you increase the chances of, of reaching people and making a difference, which I think is, um, to me, and I hope to uh, to the, to listeners, I think hopefully that's more important uh, yeah. ultimately than making money. There are other ways you can make money. There are better ways you can make money, safer, more likely to generate large sums than writing books. All right, my friend, it was a pleasure talking to you, and I enjoyed our discussion a lot. Thanks for having me, Sean. See you soon, brother.